Zambia, like many sub-Saharan African nations, relies on rainfed agriculture to produce its own sustenance. According to the International Fund for Agriculture Development, agriculture accounts for roughly 20% of Zambia's gross domestic product. However, the temperatures has been rising. Unpredictable and unreliable rain season as well as persistent drought and floods have disrupted food production. We had long rain season that would start at the end of October and that rainfall will go all the way uh, to about mid-April. Nowadays, what has happened is that uh, the rainfall will start uh, sometimes in the middle of December, about 15 December. Uh, so you, you can see that uh, oh, November has been pushed out, okay, in the middle of 15 December. And when it will start, it's quite heavy, okay? And uh, then it rains by about uh, 20th January, sometimes it will disappear, okay? And only come back uh, around mid-February again, uh, but you now have it maybe very heavy in January, and it leads to uh, floods. And this has affected uh, even the growing season in Zambia, uh, because our food in Zambia is dependent on rain-fed agriculture. According to the Accelerating Impact on CGIR Climate Research for Investment for Africa initiative, the El Nino weather patterns of 2015 and 2016 caused a severe drought that affected more than 2 million people. In 2018 and 2019, the rainy season was marked by scanty rains and extended dry periods. In 2019 and 2020, another severe drought caused by El Nino and La Nina weather patterns impacted nearly 3 million people, resulting in crop failures and water shortages. However, the western and southern provinces of Zambia are among the most prone to drought. On the Zambezi River, the western province is home to the Barotsa floodplain, one of Africa's major wetland areas and a recognized Ramsar site. The southern region is home to Mosiatunya, also known as the Victoria Falls, as well as the Kariba Dam, which is shared by both Zambia and Zimbabwe. On the northern bank of the Zambezi River at the Namibian-Zambian border in western province is the Sisheke district. The district is reliant on exports of groundnuts, rice and maize, among other agricultural products. The district normally receives between 800 and 1,000 mm of precipitation annually, but rainfall has decreased to less than 600 mm. In addition, the number of wet days has changed significantly since 2019. The rain days have drastically reduced. In 2021 2022 season, we had 70 days. This past season, 2022 2023 season, we only had 55 days of rainfall. We have a situation where uh, maybe we can have two weeks of rain in November, December. The rain disappears, maybe it reappears at the end of, uh, at the end of February. It rains a bit as well. We had over 6,000 hectares that was lost uh, to uh, dry spells this past season. We had maize, uh, 3,607 hectares. Groundnuts, we had 2,908 hectares. So when you look at uh, other crops, it's uh, a huge number of hectares that has been lost. Uh, due to uh, the dry spells that we, we had. And uh, in terms of farmers that are affected, the households, we have uh, 5,914 households that have been affected negatively due to the dry spell that we had. Care International reports that between 1980 and 2020, there were 21 flash floods in Zambia, affecting hundreds of thousands of people. Access to timely and accurate climate and weather information that can protect and assist farmers in making better decisions is a challenge, as it is in many African nations. It's very important that we improve on weather forecasting to ensure that uh, farmers are alerted well in advance in the period that they are supposed to, to plant. We receive weekly uh, bulletins uh, from uh, the MET department, but um, you find uh, sometimes the information that is there on the weekly bulletin is not what 
uh, actually transpires on the ground. So it becomes a challenge uh, for farmers. Uh, as you may already know, uh, farmers cannot put fertilizer, for example, when, when there's no rain. But if, uh, if farmers are told that this week rains are going to come, they may want to put <laughs> fertilizer in their fields and to cause the damage to, to their crops. So it's very important that uh, we receive uh, accurate weather forecasts. In addition to relying on agriculture, the population of the Zambezi River Basin plays a crucial role in providing fish for local and regional consumption. Lake Kariba alone accounts for 35% of the total fish production in Zambia and 90% in Zimbabwe. However, as a result of the drastic reduction of Kariba's water levels, the fishery industry is under immense pressure, particularly regarding the carpenter, Tanganyika sardines, introduced in the lake in the 1960s. Water is receding at alarming levels. And this has got a very terrible impact in terms of carpenter production in the lake, the breeding itself. In the 1990s, late 1990s, we used to catch for the whole industry, about 30,000 metric tons of carpenter per year. Now it has gone down to less than 8,000 metric tons per year. According to experts, high level of poverty and an increase in the number of unemployed youths are driving more people into fishing. According to fishermen, it is a simpler and less expensive means of subsistence. However, this is leading to overfishing and posing a further challenge to this transboundary lake. Well, we also have different uh, cultural approaches to and also understanding and also regulations with regard to the management. On the Zimbabwean side, it's it's largely national parks. Of course, we do have some communities, but they're well designated. Largely, it's conservation areas. Was government designated in a national park? But it's not the same case on the Zambian side. The Zambian side is just local communities, and it's free for all, more or less. They do have regulations, but nobody really follows them. So we've got different approaches. So if you look at, for example, the carpenter fishery, you know, Zimbabwe, you know, will try to abide by the number of boats that are allowed there. But the Zambians would have like um, 10 times more boats. And I, I don't think the, the, the collaboration is working very well. Or, or perhaps I would say it might need to be improved in terms of bilateral to actually, you know, you know really deal with these issues. The Zambezi is one of the largest river basins in Africa, encompassing eight countries, Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and covering an area 1.4 million kilometers square. It contains more than 40 million inhabitants. In the next two years, or by 2025, this number is projected to increase to approximately 51 million people. Transboundary cooperation is crucial for the sustainable utilization, management, and protection of the Zambezi River waters for socioeconomic benefits. The challenge is the reason why ZAMCOM was established. To say that uh, without working together, while we are sharing one river basin, one river system, you don't know what the other uh, country is planning on the same resource. So lack of information of what the other countries are doing or planning to do uh, negatively affects developments of individual countries. But number two, is uh, so much of uh, the resource that is available in the Zambezi. Zambezi is a shared river, and these are, uh, it for, for example, if you look at the border between Zambia and, Z and Zimbabwe, hundreds of kilometers forming a border between two countries. Developing any project in the, bo in the water course, therefore, require discussion, require consultation, planning together with other countries. So if there is no communication, if there is no consultation, if there is no forum, uh, you are now, you know, minimize the benefit of a shared resource. So the challenge here is a lack of deficit, which the potential is there, but individually countries cannot develop because we are not thinking together, we are not planning together, we are not utilizing together the shared resource. Despite the high water volumes and extensive land resources of the Zambezi Basin, the majority of the region's farming and fishing-based livelihood are characterized by extreme poverty. The absence of water infrastructure hinders the utilization of the abundant water resource. There is not sufficient investments 
in the Zambezi, particularly in infrastructure for water management. We are talking of um, dams to harness water because if we've got sufficient infrastructure, we are able to actually develop management systems that will ensure that you know uh, there's equity in terms of where water has to be available for the sustenance of uh, economic demands. Chelo believes that despite climate impacts, the basin has tremendous irrigation development potential. As the government as well as partners, we need to find ways in which we'll be able to use the Zambezi River more in terms of irrigating our, our, our fields. Because if we have more stress going forward, we actually need support from harvested water. So um, the water harvesting that we have uh, ready available here in Sesheke is the Zambezi River. So if we tap more uh, water from there to uh, the fields, it will be easier now for farmers to uh, produce uh, maize. Uh, we can create farm blocks, for example, for farmers to set up in an organized manner to do farming, uh, irrigated farming, that is. As the basin is a shared resource, countries are already collecting data on the water volume level, water flows, and water quality for both the surface and groundwater in order to make the most of the available resources. The Zambezi Water Coast Commission, ZAMCOM, has devised an information system that consolidates and analyzes data collected from each country. That information is then used to advise nations on how to formulate policies consistent with the river's available resources. This information about uh, water resource is, is gathered through um, a system which is called ZAMWIS, which is Zambezi Water Information System. And uh, through this, ZAMCOM is now in a better place to advise countries to provide policy, decision, uh, policy advice to the countries for them to take uh, appropriate measures. But also, uh, through this gathering of information, uh, countries can now even uh, decide to make or to even design joint projects, uh, hydropower pro projects, irrigation projects, joint but also uh, uh, country-specific uh, projects. Because now you know the volume of water that is expected throughout the year. And you also have a picture of the trends of volume of water uh, over a period of time, which gives you now leverage to even now uh, the countries now for planning of their national projects, but also um, regional projects. At the same time, ZAMCOM, in collaboration with all riparian nations, has developed a strategic plan for the Zambezi Basin. With regards to implementation, it is still in its infancy. Implementation of the strategic plan began in 2023 through PIDAC Zambezi. ZAMCOM's program for integrated development and adaptation to climate change in the Zambezi watercourse. But what are the primary challenges for the Zambezi Basin? And how will the PIDAC Zambezi help alleviate poverty and improve the climate resilient development of agricultural infrastructure? There is an infrastructure deficit. I'm talking about water supply infrastructure, irrigation infrastructure, hydropower infrastructure, roads, schools, health services. And that also contributes significantly to the hardship of the communities. Vulnerability is now higher because of lack of infrastructure. Even when there are uh, situations like droughts or situations like floods, how do you assist these communities? So the, um, the risk of vulnerability of these uh, communities is even higher because of infrastructure deficit. The fourth area or issue that was seen is land degradation. It's huge through different uh, practices, unacceptable farming practices, deforestation, charcoal making, and all these are because of the poverty. That's why now the design of the program for implementation of that strategy, which is now PIDAC Zambed, is focusing on strengthening capacity of the communities to be more resilient to climate changes. So the whole focus um, is holistic and it is a multi-sector investment program focusing on agriculture, how do we support communities in agriculture, how do we develop infrastructure to assist the communities in the basin, how do we uh, support uh, issues of climate change, water 
uh, water resources management, allocation, data and the information. How do we strengthen data and the information sharing to be able even to have early warning systems uh, which can inform communities and countries in advance of calamities that are expected. In spite of ZAMCOM's effort to persuade the riparian nations to engage in data sharing and implement PIDAC Zambezi, robust national frameworks to enhance cooperation within the countries and with strategic partners for the purposes of developing well-designed responses to the advance of climate change is lacking. There's still some inadequacy, particularly in a robust transboundary legal and institutional frameworks that are actually designed to counter the adverse impacts of uh, climate change within the eight Liberian countries. Instruments that are actually transboundary in character, as well as at the national levels, having instruments that actually also speak to the regional frameworks. Finance is essential to the development of robust frameworks. Existing is a strategic plan for the Zambezi, but there is insufficient financing in the riparian nations to downscale the regional framework, impeding the implementation of transboundary adaptation initiatives. But can local sectors working together assist countries whose finances are stretched by competing needs to finance climate resilient development efficiently? There is inadequate funding. Because if you look at the partner countries, the resources that they have are actually, there's demand for the same resources by the various sectors, like within each country. You have got tourism, you have got education, you have got security, you have got water, you have got agriculture. So you'd find that, you know, the countries are thinly spread out in terms of the resources. It would be easy to find resources you know to address some aspect of climate change if there is a framework that actually addresses that issue across the sectors so that will avoid duplication you know ministries doing the same thing like you know investing in water for schools uh, the Zambezi River Basin is one of the most valuable natural resources in Africa, providing millions of people with opportunities for subsistence agriculture and fisheries. Despite being profoundly impacted by climate change, if the basin is managed sustainably, expanding irrigation has the potential to lift the growing population out of poverty. In addition to long-term water level monitoring, what else must be done to ensure sustainability? Instrument number one is to have information and data. Because that, the science behind the changes will tell us what we need to do in terms of what, to, what how to design, what to design to accommodate the changes that are happening uh, with the uh, climate change. But more is about uh, awareness to the communities. We need to start communicating these changes. The climate change is a reality. We need to find ways, experts in mass media, mass communication, you know, in the messages that can be clear to the communities so that communities also understand their contribution to climate change uh, effects and what it needs to be done. If it is uh, about uh, um, conservation of natural resources, including forests and other things, you know, good practices. The other thing which, apart from awareness, is to deliver to the communities innovative ways of their survival innovative ways of using the resource, you know, which is not destructive to the wetlands, but also which is conserving, but at the same time, uh, which is giving them the sustenance of their lives and their needs uh, at their communities. So as, a, as a institutions, as a regional and the international community in general, I think we have that obligation to now think beyond just creating rules, rules and laws we probably need to be more facilitating uh, how these communities should be now living in a manner which will be conserving uh, the land, minimizing land degradation, uh, minimizing deforestation and the like.
The Africa Climate Resilient Investment Facility, AFRIRES, is assisting African nations including national governments, river basin organizations, regional economic communities and power pools, the private sector such as project developers and financiers to plan, design and implement climate resilient investments in sectors such as agriculture, energy, water, transport, cities and ecosystems. What functions can the facility serve? One of the area that is still, uh, it requires a lot of support, is infrastructure for data and the information collection. That is, uh, you know, putting in place stations which can record um, flows of water, quality of water, but also volume of water over a period of time. So monitoring of the entire uh, resource over a period of time in the eight riparian states. But also uh, issues of um, capacity building. The capacity we are talking about here is more for the countries to be able to implement uh, some of the agreed priority projects and interventions. To be able to develop policies, to develop a national policies, national legal framework, which is responsive to climate change issues that are happening in the region. Capacity of the region, but also capacity of uh, ZAMCO to be able to undertake all those uh, activities.